Okay, let's begin. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the C2 Smart webinar series. I'm John Patinos, a project manager here at C2 Smart. Just a heads up that this webinar will be recorded and posting to this C2 Smart YouTube channel. We'll have some time for questions at the end. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box at the bottom of your screen, and I'll read them to the presenter at the end of today's presentation. Today, we're with Professor Lee Jin, Assistant Professor in the Department of Civil and Urban Engineering at NYU Tandon. His research focuses on developing resilient control algorithms for cyber physical systems. Today, he joins us to discuss his work using queuing models to design connected and autonomous transportation systems. Professor Jin. Please. All right, thank you, uh, John, for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, seminar. And in this seminar, I will talk about uh, some recent work uh, by us uh, that applies queuing models or uh, various versions of queuing models to solve transportation uh, problems, and uh, particularly in the context of connected and, and uh, autonomous transportation systems. Okay, so this is the outline of uh, this talk. I will first uh, give uh, some background of queuing models as well as some um, persistent challenges uh, in connected and autonomous transportation systems and argue why queuing models are relevant for solving challenges in these contexts. And then I will go through four specific applications of queuing models in uh, connected and, and autonomous transportation systems. That's uh, uh, coordinating um, CACC-based uh, vehicle platooning, sequencing at signal-free intersections. That's also based on uh, V2V and V2I communications and possibly uh, self-driving uh, functions. And I will also talk about robust routing for connected intersections and uh, security uh, uh, of, uh, of transportation networks. So first, a bit of acknowledge, uh, acknowledgement to uh, my team members, uh, as well as uh, collaborators from uh, worldwide. And uh, this work won't be possible without uh, their contribution. All right, so first a bit history of queuing models. Um, so the theory of queuing models uh, uh, was sort of initiated uh, in the 1840s by French mathematician Poisson, uh, who analyzed the behavior of uh, a set of arrival processes called Poisson processes. And not until the 1920s, uh, a Danish mathematician and engineer, Erlan, uh, considered uh, queuing models for the first time in the context of uh, phone service. And the theory was uh, uh, sort of um, uh, well uh, progressed in the 1950s, uh, where uh, John Little developed uh, or obtained the Little's law that relates the waiting time, the arrival rate, and queue size in, uh, in a very general set of queuing models. And that's also the time when Kendall invented the, the notation, such as MM1, MG1, or uh, GG1. And in the 1960s, Jackson extended the analysis of queuing models from single servers to networks of servers. So from then on, we have been focusing largely on uh, networks of queuing models. So all these uh, theory was there for quite a, um, uh, quite a while. So then what's the use of queuing model? Why are they relevant, uh, particularly for transportation research? So here are some, some of my understanding of, uh, of this question. So what queuing model captures is the queuing due to random arrival and or random service time. Okay. But it does not capture the uh, queuing or congestion due to environmental fluctuation, such as uh, uh, traffic incidents, for example. There are variations of queuing models that, get, that does capture this, 
but that's not the first order motivation of queuing model. Okay, so what can we do with queuing model? We can use queuing, queuing model to do routing, sequencing, service rate control, and admission control in transportation networks, which we typically model as queuing networks. And they have been successfully applied to a variety of transportation systems, including passenger traffic, urban traffic, and air traffic. All right, so since now, um, technology is uh, progressing very fast, a very natural question to ask. In the age of uh, artificial in intelligence, where everything is, uh, or is, is increasingly connected and uh, autonomous, do classical queuing model still apply to this new setting? And uh, if we need to modify them, what kind of mod uh, modifications are needed? and uh, how to integrate them with uh, new technologies such as artificial intelligence. So before uh, we get into the details, we first need to specify what are the key functions of connected and uh, autonomous transportation systems or uh, CAS for short, which is a cute name, I think. Um, so uh, this uh, page shows four typical functions adaptive traffic light, that is the number of seconds of uh, red light can be adjusted uh, according to the real-time traffic condition. We can also have cooperative adaptive cruise control where vehicles communicate with each other in a real-time manner so that they can travel with a much uh, smaller uh, distance from each other than conventional vehicles. And we can also have connected and smart intersections. Uh, we can even get rid of traffic lights if there is sufficient communication and control capability available in the infrastructure side. We can also do dynamic traffic assignment in response to real-time traffic conditions. So these are the key functions of uh, CATS that we consider at least in this presentation. And the main question that I'm to argue is how will queuing model be relevant to address challenges in these, uh, in these uh, functions? So how queuing model helps artificial intelligence? So uh, first, artificial intelligence is a quite uh, generic concept. And let's be more uh, particular. That is how does queuing model help reinforcement learning, which is one of the most important uh, concepts in artificial intelligence. So the figure on the right shows a, a representative loop of reinforcement learning where there is an agent taking some actions in an environment that is ever evolving. The action will impact the environment and the, uh, the environment will evolve and send some reward collected by the agent. So the answer to the question, how queuing model helps artificial intelligence, um, I got two of them. First is that a queuing model can help indirect reinforcement learning. So what is indirect reinforcement learning? This figure shows uh, direct and indirect reinforcement learning. If the learning is directly done from experience and uh, directly generates uh, the action or the value that leads to the action, then that is called uh, direct reinforcement learning. If the learning process is uh, uh, done in two phases, in the first phase, a model is learned or the parameters of a model is learned from experience and then actions are taken based on prediction of the model, then that is called indirect reinforcement learning. And queuing model can fit into here. It can be one of the models that, uh, uh, make up indirect reinforcement learning. Another answer is queuing models, uh, as well as other analytical models in general, allow provable guarantees on um, particular properties of the system, such as uh, what's the guaranteed throughput of a transportation network and uh, whether the waiting time is bounded or not. These kind of questions cannot be answered uh, from a purely learning-based pers uh, perspective. We do need analytical models 
to answer these questions. All right, so uh, that's all for the uh, introduction. And next I will go through the four applications one by one. The first is vehicle platooning in mixed autonomy. Mixed autonomy means uh, um, a road with both CAVs and non-CAVs. Okay, so, um, so this kind of technology or operation is, is actually a sequence of uh, CAVs uh, that move one after another. Each vehicle reports its kinematic information, including velocity, um, position, angular velocity, angular position to each other, as well as their intended maneuvers to the neighboring vehicles. Because of the sharing of this information, vehicles can travel with very short distance from each other. So there are two benefits of doing that. First, traffic is more compact, so the uh, capacity of roads can be increased. And the second, reduce the distance between vehicles will reduce the air drag taken by the following vehicles and that will save fuel on the following vehicles. These are the two motivations for vehicle platooning. But one challenge faced by this operation is that uh, uh, it, it makes smooth traffic into discrete bulks of vehicles. The consequence is that uh, Cluster platoons can create bottlenecks. So this figure here shows one example where uh, platoons of vehicles can create bottlenecks. Suppose that you, ha you have a lot of uh, uh, platoons, which are the vehicles in purple in this figure, clustered near the bottleneck. And the same vehicles are those vehicles that want to exit the highway from the off-ramp. And because of, because of the congestion here, the movement of the sign vehicles will be uh, undermined. They cannot get out of there. So this will uh, reduce the efficiency of highway. So this is the particular scenario that we are considering. And our solution is to evenly distribute platoons to avoid clustering, that is, you artificially decelerate some of the platoons so that they do not uh, create significant congestion at the bottleneck uh, and thus does not uh, affect the movement of the sign vehicles. So the main question is uh, are as follows. First, how much loss is caused by cluster platoons? And that's the baseline case where we don't uh, do any coordination between the platoons. And the loss is measured in terms of throughput loss and uh, increased travel time. And the second question is how to address this kind of loss, how to regulate movement of platoons. And uh, uh, we can decompose that into several sub questions such as how plat uh, which uh, platoons need to decelerate and how long should the platoons be. And we also uh, uh, need to uh, quantify how much benefit can be obtained by regulating the platoons? For example, by regulating them, how much throughput can we obtain and how much travel time can we reduce? So these are the main questions that we ask. So uh, a key uh, step to answer these questions is to uh, choose the best model that fits the scenario. In terms of uh, connected, uh, and the autonomous vehicles, there is a spectrum of models that have been used. And here is a table summarizing them. From the very low uh, vehicle level to the very high network or city level. At the vehicle level, uh, typically used is the kinematic model, uh, which uh, captures the uh, position, angular position, acceleration, and angular acceleration of vehicles. They are uh, robotics like models with a lot of uh, detailed information. At the intersection level, queuing model is, uh, is uh, typically used. And at the segment level, partial differential equation based models are used for speed regulation, that is uh, speed limit control and managing the size of uh, platoons and lane management. And at a 
uh, even higher level, link level. So link can be viewed as a cascade of segments. So at that level, PDE model may be too sophisticated, and we further reduce that into fluid models, which capture some features of PDE model, but with a significant simplification. And they can be used for headway regulation and managing the size of platoons. And that's the model we choose for this work. So this is a fluid model, not queuing model in the classical sense, but we will show that it has a close uh, link to classical queuing models, such as MM1. And at the network level, uh, typically static queuing, uh, sorry, static travel time function models are used for traffic assignment or longer term decision making. Okay. All right, so this is the fluid model that we use for mixed autonomy bottleneck. There are uh, several types of traffic moving on the road section. First is a flow of non-CAV traffic, which we assume to be a constant in flow. And the CAV will arrive in box, uh, which leads to Poisson jumps in the traffic volume. So this figure shows the Poisson jumps. When the vehicle arrives, the traffic volume will suddenly jump. Okay. In addition, CAV traffic is compressed by a factor gamma that is greater than one, so this factor gamma captures the reduced distance between vehicles. And uh, the dynamics that governs the evolution of this model is basically conservation law and uh, uh, the so-called spillback phenomenon at the bottleneck. That is, if this highlighted portion of road is congested, off-ramp traffic will be held. And uh, this will uh, cause um, inefficient utilization of the off-ramp capacity and thus leads to throughput loss. And that's actually the main phenomenon that we want to get rid of using regulating uh, platoons. Okay, here is the connection of the fluid model to classical queuing model or MD1 model in particular. Consider the baseline case without any regulation of the movement of platoons. Since vehicles arrive as Poisson process, we can construct an MD1 process embedded in the fluid model. The arrival process is uh, basically the ar arrival process of the platoons, which is a Poisson process, and that's why we have M here. The service rate uh, will be the difference between the bottleneck capacity and the background traffic flow. Basically, the road capacity that is available to uh, CAVs or to uh, platoons. And that will be the service rate for the deterministic service time. And here is a lemma that we developed. Uh, the mainline track volume in the fluid model is bounded from both sides by the MD1 process. So in this figure here, the thick solid line is the fluid process and it's upper bounded by uh, an MD1 process from the above, okay, and also a uh, another uh, sort of MD1 process from uh, below. And the figure on the right shows how the CDFs of these three processes are related. Once again, the CDF of the fluid process or the CDF of the steady state Q size in the fluid process is bounded from both sides by the, uh, by the MD1 model. Okay, so with that model, we ask the question, how is, uh, so uh, what is the throughput if there is no regulation of platoons? So to do that, we first need to define what we mean by throughput. Um, there are a, ver a variety of ways of defining that. Uh, so intuitively, it is essentially the amount of traffic that uh, this road section can discharge over unit time. And uh, from, a, uh, from a, a, a mathematical perspective, we define throughput in terms of uh, stability. So we say that the fluid traffic queue is uh, stable if it's bounded on average. So bounded in the sense that is analogous to uh, bounded MD1 queue size. And throughput will, will be the maximal arrival rate ensuring stability. 
So uh, to answer or, or, or to analyze the throughput, we first need to understand how platoons can affect the throughput. Uh, as we discussed, if many platoons are clustered at the bottleneck, they will block the upstream traffic. Okay, so blocking traffic leads to wasting off-ramp capacity and that leads to throughput loss. But how to quantify this? Here is a result that we developed. So a bar is the throughput, the actual throughput, um, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to exactly compute it, but we can derive upper and lower bounds for the actual throughput. The upper bound results from the MD1 process that we just uh, considered, and the, the lower bound results from a Lyapunov function based approach. And this work has been recently conditionally accepted by a transaction of automatic control. With that result, we can do some analysis like this. So we uh, tune uh, or, which, or we vary three key parameters uh, of this model. First is the fraction of CAVs out of all the traffic. Second is the size of platoons. And third is the buffer size, which characterizes the, different, uh, the distance between the bottleneck and the off-ramp. So if we increase the fraction of platoons because traffic become more compact, the throughput will be increasing. And the red curve is the upper bound, blue curve is the lower bound. The orange curve is the theoretically maximal throughput that can be attained if there were no spillback or no uh, interference of vehicles at the off-ramp. And as you can see, this theoretically maximal throughput is not attained because it's higher than the upper bound. And the same thing happens for um, the other two figures. If we increase the platoon size, uh, the throughput will first increase and then decrease, which means there is optimal platoon size uh, that would maximize throughput. It's intuitive because if you uh, platoon vehicles, you make traffic compact, but if platoons are too long, then uh, they will uh, occupy the bottleneck for a very long time and that will lead to spillback. And third is the uh, buffer size. That is, if the bottleneck and off-ramp are far away from each other, then the throughput will be increased. But for all three scenarios, theoretically, maximal throughput is not attained due to spillback. And let's now fix this with uh, control. So the optimal regulation of platooning is to separate the platoons by this amount. A platoon size over the uh, road capacity that is available to uh, platoons. Furthermore, we can exactly compute the Q, uh, the, the Q size, the average Q size, uh, if this control is applied. Okay, so this is an analytical solution. That means we now attain the orange lines on the previous slide. So how does that work? Well, that basically uh, avoids clustering of uh, platoons. So if you look at the figure on the right, without regulation, the jump due to arrivals of two platoons may overlap with each other and that will uh, add up to each other. And what the control does is uh, very simple. That is, uh, it will postpone the following peak so that the two jumps will not overlap so that uh, congestion will not accumulate at the bottleneck and off-ramp traffic will not be uh, affected. So that was based on the sort of idealized uh, fluid model. And now we validate uh, the results in more sophisticated settings. The first is the cell transmission model with a macroscopic traffic flow model capturing the shock wave. Uh, so uh, this curve, is the uh, vehicle miles traveled observed uh, in the cell transmission model. And uh, uh, the orange line is the theoretically optimal headway between platoons predicted by the fluid model. So the theoretical optimal is uh, 36 seconds, while the empirical optimal is 30 seconds, which is not far away. And we also validate uh, our uh, result in, in SUMO, which is a microscopic simulation tool, and a similar results is observed. 
for some ongoing work uh, for vehicle platooning, in, uh, in practice, a key question that we need to ask is how do we estimate the parameters that allow us to compute the optimal control action? For example, CV arrival rate, non-CV arrival rate, bottleneck capacity, and all these parameters uh, are constantly changing over time. Okay, if you estimate these parameters yesterday, they will change uh, like in one week or so, for sure. And our solution is to use lear learning-based adaptive control. That is, we develop an estimator that learns key parameters from observed data in a real-time and continuing manner, feed estimated parameters into the theoretical framework to compute optimal solutions, and refine the model predictive controller with neural networks. Basically, we use reinforcement learning to track uh, or, or, or to, to learn and track the ever-changing environment. All right, so that finishes the first part on vehicle platooning. Second is signal-free intersections. Uh, so this is um, uh, not really a new intersect, uh, new uh, operations be because there are already a lot of signal-free intersections out there uh, in in the country where there is a stop sign. Uh, put at the intersection, and the drivers will use their uh, own sense own sense to determine the sequencing of the vehicles. But what what we are doing here is, is actually using a roadside unit to serve as a virtual traffic police. What happens is that uh, at an in, at an intersection, information will be exchanged between vehicles and the roadside unit, uh, so that their movement is coordinated and regulated. And the vehicles may or may not be autonomous. If they are human drivers, uh, maybe uh, the, inc the instruction have to be simple because human cannot implement complicated instructions. But if the vehicles are autonomous, then the roadside unit can send high frequency and sophisticated instructions to the vehicles. Okay, so what people have done uh, are largely uh, in the um, robotics side or uh, motion optimization side. Um, but what has not been addressed is how to estimate the throughput and waiting time of the, of the in intersection if some autonomous vehicle sequencing algorithm is applied. So far, uh, they only guarantee uh, safety of the uh, of the intersection, but no guarantee on the uh, performance, including throughput and waiting time, has been developed, and that is what we will address using queuing model. Okay, so here are several main questions. First, how to model the aggregate behavior of traffic at signal-free intersections? How to determine the sequence for vehicles to go through intersections? How to estimate efficiency gain? in the sense of long-term average due to virtual traffic policing with respect to the baseline case without any intervention. And particularly for autonomous vehicles, how much benefits, how much long-term average benefit can signal-free intersections bring with respect to signalized intersections? So this is uh, how we uh, approach the answer. So we consider, uh, a fairly simple setting as a starting point, two lanes, no turning, okay? So two one-way lanes intersecting each other and there's no turning uh, between the two lanes. And uh, vehicles arrive as Poisson processes with weights lambda one and lambda two. Every vehicle needs S bar of seconds, a deterministic number S bar of seconds to go through the intersection. And the vehicles must be at least A seconds apart if they are in the same direction and B seconds apart if they are in the different directions. This is uh, similar to an MD1 process because uh, the arrival rates are Poisson. Uh, although there are two, two of them, they are independent from each other. So if you combine them, you still have a Poisson process with the rate lambda one plus lambda two. And the service time, uh, is seemingly S bar seconds for each vehicle, but because of the uh, 
spacing constraint between vehicles is not an MD1 process. But the good news is that we, so it's a, it's a still a queuing process uh, with, uh, uh, with, with, with some refinement um, due to the uh, direction or which lane the vehicles are on. So the good news is that we can still use a Markovian queuing model to capture this and the state will be uh, queuing size and the residual passing times. That is the residual uh, waiting time that one vehicle has to experience. Okay. So by the way, MD1 process is not a markup process if you just consider the queue size. So in this sense, we are not uh, increasing the state variable to, uh, uh, as opposed to uh, the Markovian re representation of MD1 process. So here is a preliminary, preliminary result that we get. Under the first come first served sequencing policy, the traffic queues are stable if this, in, this inequality holds. And uh, furthermore, if this inequality holds, then the to total queue size is upper bounded uh, by this formula here. Okay. So X bar is the average queue size. Lambda one and lambda two are the arrival rates. S bar is the uh, intersection passing time. A is the uh, minimal headway between vehicles in the same direction. And B is the minimal headway between vehicles from different directions. So this is an analytical upper bound that uh, characterizes the waiting time of signal-free intersections. And several uh, ongoing work uh, is as follows. First, optimal sequencing for heterogeneous vehicles. We've been considering first come, first, uh, first come, first served and the homogeneous vehicles. But what if vehicles are associated with different service times and different uh, basically headways or headway requirements between them? And second, what if we do not have direct knowledge of the parameters such as lambda one and A and B. So the solution will be to use learning-based adaptive sequencing where neural networks will approximate the value functions and we can use the queuing model to supervise the training of, this new, uh, of, of the neural networks. And we can also extend this analysis to intersections to do coordinated sequencing and joint routing and sequencing of connected intersections. And yet another ongoing work, which is not within the scope of queuing model, but is directly related to signal free, in, uh, free intersections uh, is the, ve the vehicle trajectory optimization in the, con uh, in, the, in the presence of communication latency and packet loss. So what we are working on is to try to design virtual traffic Reg uh, regulating algorithm that is consistent with capability of cyber infrastructure, uh, including sensing, communication, and computing. And uh, we want to use queuing model to establish quantitative link between cyber specifications, such as lat latency and packet loss rate and physical per uh, performance, including throughput and uh, delay. Okay, so that was uh, for single intersections. If we are doing traffic control over a network of intersections, uh, as we discussed, uh, one way is for sure to use reinforcement learning, but another way of addressing unknown parameters is to do robust control. What does that mean? Suppose that we know the topology of a network of intersections, but we do not know the parameters, uh, the arrival and service rates, of the intersections. And what we can do is that uh, we can develop controls that will be valid no matter what the, per, uh, the parameters are, okay? So solution one is the learning-based solution. That is, we learn from the environment uh, the parameters of the model. That's called learning-based adaptive control. That's efficient and smart, but that requires sufficient data to, uh, to learn and it's vulnerable to unhealthy data. If the data is wrong, your decision will be wrong. And the second solution is the perspective of robust control. That is, we be a bit conservative so that no matter what parameter is realized, 
some performance can always be guaranteed. It's easy and robust. It does not, uh, it, it is immune to uh, unhealthy data, but it does not guarantee optimality or efficiency. So it's really a trade-off between uh, resiliency and uh, efficiency. So the second uh, solution, the robust control solution, motivates the idea of model data independent control. That is uh, control policy that are independent of arrival at the service rates. All right, so the main questions are how to control a network of intersections if we only know the topology but do not know the parameters. So we consider uh, a simpler uh, framework that is a queuing network with Poisson arrivals and exponential service rates, basically Jackson networks. But we consider multiple origins and multiple destinations, and we don't allow cycles in the network. We assume that we can observe real-time OD specific queue sizes at all servers. So this is um, possible for uh, most uh, uh, connected uh, or uh, transportation facilities with vehicle to infrastructure connectivity. And we can route, sequence, and hold customers, but we do not know the arrival and service rates. So uh, what people have done uh, in terms of model data independent control is in this setting, or the simplest setting, where we have a set of parallel queues. And an intuitive routing policy for this setting is the join the shortest queue policy, or the JSQ policy. That is, as a customer arrives, he or she will go to the shortest queue, and times are broken uniformly at, at random. And it is well known that uh, such a set of parallel queues will be stable under this JSQ policy if and only if the arrival rate is less than the total service rate. It is even optimal if the servers are symmetric. The JSQ policy is model data independent because it only requires information about the current queue sizes and it does not require information about arrival or service rates. It maximizes the throughput in the sense that as long as the demand is less than the total capacity, the system is stable. But unfortunately, uh, JSQ in its original form fails for networks. So here is an example where this policy fails. In the above, uh, there is a traffic flow of uh, Lambda 1 Poisson arrival at the origin, and the JSQ is applied at the origin for uh, server one and server three. By symmetry and Berkey's theorem, departure processes from servers one and three are both Poisson processes of rate 0.5. However, 0.5 exceeds the uh, service rate of server two, so the network is unstable. So JSQ fails for networks. So uh, the, uh, how do we resolve this failure? Uh, it requires some uh, inspection of uh, what's going on, uh, so what's wrong here. So uh, if JSQ is applied here, what happens is that server two will be congested, but this information of congestion is not used at the origin. So to fix this, we consider the total queue sizes on the route. That is, if the total queue uh, in servers one and two is smaller, then a customer will be routed to server one and ties are broken uniformly at random. And we call this drawing the shortest route policy. Okay, so what if the network is not simply uh, parallel and serial uh, links? For example, this, uh, this network is neither parallel nor serial. Then the route sum that we used on the previous slide uh, is not easy to extend, but we can consider an alternative so the formula here looks sophisticated, but they are essentially piecewise linear combinations of the Q sizes. Okay. And we define these uh, piecewise linear uh, Q size as the sort of route size or the route traffic. And we choose, uh, uh, and, and we always allocate uh, customers to the route with the smallest uh, uh, YK. And this applies to multi-origin destination traffic, but it's a centralized control because it requires global information. 
but it is independent of model data. So what we were able to prove is that uh, this policy stabilizes network if and only if the network can be stabilized. So the next question is, can we decentralize this uh, routing policy? Uh, so far, we, only, uh, able, we are only able to prove this for single class networks, that is single origin and a single destination. So why does JSQ does not work for networks? Because congested information cannot propagate to upstream nodes. So our solution is to use artificial holding to propagate such information. So this is the result. A single class network can be uh, is uh, stabilized by a decentralized control such that first, the control will guarantee that upstream queues are always no smaller than the downstream queues because of the artificial holding that we do. And second, uh, the routing is done in the, in the shortest, uh, shortest queue principle. So how does this work? Okay. So uh, under that proposed decentralized uh, control policy, the traffic in server one will be held or will be prevented from discharging, from, uh, discharging downstream if the queue size in server one is less than or equal to the queue sizes in server two and server three, okay? And by doing that, the congestion information in the downstream servers can be propagated to the upstream server. Whether it can be done for multi-class networks is, is unknown yet. All right, so uh, the last uh, application that we consider is a uh, security analysis of transportation systems. Uh, connected and, uh, and autonomous transportation systems heavily rely on real-time information flowing through the network. And how does data quality and integrity impact performance? How cybersecurity vulnerabilities impact physical system? This question has not been very well understood. So once again, we use queuing model uh, with some other uh, theoretical tools to, uh, to approach the answer to this question. That is the security risk facing uh, or faced by uh, intelligent transportation systems or uh, uh, CATS. So this is a scenario that we consider uh, a fairly simple transportation system, a set of parallel links, and uh, the system operator will assign traffic to each link according to real-time traffic condition, okay? So X hat is the observed uh, traffic condition. And these uh, observation can be randomly, um, uh, can be attacked by some malicious adversary at random times. And the, uh, and the target of the, of, of the attack can also be random. And the system operator has some resource to, re uh, to, uh, to recover the observation. But the resource is, is limited so that uh, um, it can, uh, the, si the system operator cannot prevent uh, attacks from happening completely. The research questions are as follows. First, how to model stochastic and recurrent attacks, which is uh, very common in computer networks. And how to quantify attackers' incentive to launch, and to launch attacks. How to quantify the impact due to attacks and how to evaluate the security risk due to attacks. And in terms of uh, response, there are uh, two actions. First is resource allocation, how to allocate security resources, including redundant components, diagnosis mechanisms, or even human ins uh, inspectors, et cetera. And how to design the uh, routing policy so that it is more resilient against uh, uh, security failures. So we use a queuing model to capture the evolution of the underlying transportation network. Poisson arrival of rate lambda and uh, the state of the network will be the vector of queue sizes. And we consider the drawing the shortest queue uh, policy as the baseline, which is optimal if the servers are symmetric. Note that implementing this drawing the shortest queue policy will require perfect information about the real-time 
uh, Q sizes, X of T. And if the observation is imperfect, then there is a chance that uh, the closed loop control or join the shortest queue policy may even be worse than open loop control, such as Bernoulli routing. And we capture the interaction between the attacker and the system operator or the defender from a, uh, a game theoretic perspective. So we formulate a security game between the attacker and the defender. Uh, we consider two failure modes uh, that can be done from the attacker's perspective. Denial of service, that is the attacker cut off the observation of the traffic condition on certain links. And uh, second, Spoofing is that the attacker can manipulate the information that is uh, received by the system operator. And the, the, uh, both attack will induce a technological cost on the attacker. They need to invest in hardware or software to launch this kind of attacks. And the attacker is aimed to maximize the, queue, uh, the queuing cost experienced by the system. And the defender is able to secure uh, the information, but once again, with some defending cost. So the defender wants to minimize the queuing cost. Okay. So this is a dynamic Markovian infinite horizon security game. And uh, we next analyze the equilibrium of the game uh, to get some insights about uh, the security risk of the system. So here are some preliminary results. First, if we only consider two servers uh, and only a de denial of service attacks, then uh, there are two conclusions. First, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, defending policy of the defender will be either defend or not to defend. There is no probabilistic uh, defense in this setting. And the second, the larger the difference between the two Q sizes, the larger the risk is. So what does that mean? That means suppose that you have a, uh, some protection mechanism that can be turned on and off, but turning it on will cost you some, uh, let's say energy or uh, human labor, then you don't need to turn it on if the difference between the Q size is small, but you do need to turn it on if the difference is large. And the second result is a regime analysis of uh, the attacker and defender's uh, actions. So these two figures shows the regimes of the game. The vertical axis is the cost of launching attacks and the vertical, sorry, the hori uh, horizontal axis is the cost of, of launching attacks and the vertical axis is the defending cost. If the attacking cost is very high, then the, def then the attacker has no incentive to attack. Consequently, the defender will not have to defend. If the attacking cost is lower, then there will be non-zero uh, prob prob uh, probability of attacking and defense. And these are preliminary results, which we are extending to more general settings. Uh, in particular, um, uh, uh, multiple number of servers as opposed to just uh, two servers. And this is uh, part of our uh, ongoing work. Okay, to sum up, uh, what we have argued is that queuing models can capture fundamental characteristics of transportation systems. And uh, such fundamental char characteristics also apply to a connected and autonomous transportation systems. But we do need modifications and a synthesis and a refinement uh, to make these, uh, to make queuing model really helpful to, uh, to addressing problems in, in, in CATS. And we can integrate queuing model with nonlinear control, reinforcement learning, robust control, and game theory. And we can uh, obtain theoretical guarantees, practical insights, and a computational efficiency from queuing model. And these uh, properties uh, cannot, be, cannot be obtained from a purely learning-based perspective. Okay, so uh, uh, I will finish here and uh, I'm ready to answer questions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Professor. If anyone has any questions, as I said at the beginning, please feel free to enter them into the chat box below and I will read them out loud to Professor Jin. Okay, I have one question here. I wanna make sure I understand this correctly. Uh, why 
if you can go back to when you when you first introduced the MD1, um, why why do you use MD1 in in the first project that you discussed? Okay, the reason is that uh, um, since this is a fluid model, um, the service uh, re uh, so the service process is deterministic in the sense that. Uh, let's say 10 vehicles will be uh, served uh, uh, during let's say uh, 10 seconds and this number is fixed because it's a fluid model there is no randomness in the service process of this fluid model and that uh, that will make the model behave as if it is an md1 process but it's not really an md1 process in itself it's just an embedded md1 process in the fluid process Okay. So um, I also had a question. Uh, you spoke a little bit about uh, queuing models and how else they're being used. But could you speak a little bit more about how else queuing models are being used in the field today? Uh, queuing models are also used. Uh, uh, well, it's uh, it's heavily used in air transportation, such as uh, uh, analysis of terminal area operations. Uh, and uh, landing and uh, taking off actions. So queuing model is fairly uh, common there. And uh, in particular, they are used for congestion pricing for uh, different types of aircraft. And uh, uh, this model is actually used for justifying congestion pricing uh, in practice at, uh, at airports. It's also uh, heavily used in the community of communications and networking. Uh, because they consider the transmission of uh, data packets and uh, uh, and uh, tasks in computer and communication networks, and there are processors and servers who, who will uh, have a limited capacity of discharging the traffic, and uh, queuing model are very commonly used there. Okay, I have another one here from a member of the audience. Um, how how will you be testing cybersecurity issues? Are you using simulation to test your um, to test cybersecurity issues? Like, mm -hmm. um, so currently, it's mostly uh, about a theoretical concept that is to understand uh, some fundamental uh, behavior that could happen, because uh, cybersecurity uh, or cyber physical security uh, is really a uh, futuristic setting because uh, um, it has not uh, uh, extensively happened now because uh, things are not that connected and uh, autonomous at this moment but as we increase the um, uh, the level of automation and the connectivity of transportation systems we do need to predict what's going to happen what's going to be the risk of making things connected and autonomous. And queuing theory is one of the tools that help us to develop insights into this question. And in terms of uh, simulation or even experiment, there are some groups that um, have actually hacked into transportation facilities such as traffic light controllers and traffic sensors, but uh, uh, they're mostly done in a lab laboratory setting. But what they have demonstrated that it, it's fairly easy to do that. So there is a urgent need to understand the, and address this challenge. Sure. So I have, um, oh, okay. I have another question here. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the Poisson jump process and how you address it in your fluid model? So the Poisson jump process, uh, happens here. Right, so uh, when a platoon of vehicles enter the highway, this, this highway section, it will lead to a sudden jump in the number of vehicles in the road. The rationale is that a platoon is a rather bulked uh, set of vehicles. So it's not a smooth flow of traffic, and that is why there are Poisson jumps. And the reason why it's modeled as a Poisson process is first uh, Poisson process is, is easy to analyze 
And second, uh, there is uh, extensive randomness in the process of uh, formation of the platoons. So Poisson process is uh, first order or the simplest uh, way that we can capture this kind of randomness. Okay, I have one last one from the audience here. Um, so the queuing, model, queuing models might be different in each lane or might, uh, for example, in less congested conditions, this will reshape the queue more frequently. How do you think about these issues in your approach? Uh, I'm sorry, are you asking about uh, the heterogeneous uh, heterogeneity of the queuing servers? It seems that way. So with each lane differing on the amount of congestion, so like in mixed autonomy, you'd have uh, some non-autonomous vehicles more in other lanes and how the, the heterogeneity would affect your approach. Oh, I see. So this kind of lower level information is not captured uh, by the fluid model. And uh, this simplification or, or approximation is valid because uh, later we test our results obtained from the fluid model in SUMO. And in SUMO, this kind of uh, complication does have an impact. And the simulation results shows that uh, uh, although it has an impact, the impact does not devalidate the fluid model-based results. Okay, and that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for answering those questions and thank you to the participants for asking these questions. Once thank again, you. this webinar was recorded and can be found uh, later this afternoon or next week on the C2Smart YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us and Professor Jin, thank you very much once again. We hope we'll be speaking with you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you to all and uh, have a good day.